Hey, you're gonna love this interview with Dylan Bynan all about how psychedelics can treat mental health disorders. His startup Mindbloom is administering ketamine to all sorts of different use cases. And in today's interview, we not only talk about the origins of the company and how to build a telehealth startup, but a whole lot more. Helping people with anxiety and depression now, uh, but there's some great clinical research around ketamine and other psychedelic therapies' efficacy for things like um, OCD, PTSD, eating disorder, social anxiety disorder, couples therapy. Well, Dylan, thanks for coming on the show, man. I'm excited to be talking with you. Thanks, Aaron. I'm fired up. So, uh, in the world of startups, and particularly saliently post pandemic. Um, this concept of telehealth, telemedicine um, is either the, you know, I have, I have friends who've been like consultants in healthcare for 20 years and they're like, we've been talking about this forever. Or there's people like, wow, cutting edge, new, beep boop. Um, and, and the two kind of brands in my mind in the startup world that epitomize that, that listeners may be more likely to be familiar with if they haven't yet heard of Mind Bloom, are Roman and Hymns. Romans raised $876 million. They'll, you know, send you a testosterone and other sort of products. Hims, you know, similar beachhead, hair loss, erectile dysfunction, depression, via exclusively a telehealth visit. To help people start off, can you kind of use them as almost like a foil or a, a, a cousin of yours to explain what's similar about Mind Bloom and what's different? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the CEO of Hims, Andrew Dudum, is actually a really close friend of mine of like 15 years. He was a year younger than me in my fraternity at Penn. Uh, and I probably wouldn't be building Mindbloom if it wasn't for the uh, trail that he blazed building the biggest telemedicine company, I think, in the world. Wow. Um, yeah, so, so Mindbloom is a direct-to-consumer brand uh, that's helping people achieve life-changing clinical and personal breakthroughs uh, with at-home psychedelic therapy. Specifically, uh, we're using ketamine therapy, which is the only prescribable psychedelic medication in the U.S., uh, to help people today with anxiety and depression uh, in, I think, about 15 states reaching 70% uh, of the U.S. population, uh, soon to be most of the U.S. Uh, there are a lot of similarities between us and Hims and Roman. Uh, we have a, a network of partner providers who are uh, prescribing the medication and overseeing the medical care, uh, but there are also some uh, differences. Uh, one is in addition to the prescribing of the treatment, uh, we also provide a network of coaches who are psychedelic guides who are going deep with people to help them prepare, uh, get the most out of their experiences, and then integrate those experiences or actually take what comes up and put it into action in their life and leverage the neuroplastic state created by psychedelics to create real behavioral and emotional changes in their life. Uh, and we also have a sort of headspace or calm for psychedelic therapy app that includes music and meditations and therapeutic programs for things like anxiety and depression and self-love and, and loneliness and other indications and issues. Uh, so it kind of combines those three things. As a result, uh, whereas HIMS might spend you know, six minutes uh, with every patient, uh, we're spending over six hours with every new client that goes through a six session course of treatment with Mindbloom. Gotcha. And so is the, the basic thesis here, you know, mind bloom and, and just kind of generally like positioning it as a psychedelic as treatment for mental health challenges type mm -hmm. of brand, uh, at least in the short to midterm opens the door where, you know, kind of ketamine would be the beachhead, so to speak. And, you know, where some of those other brands, maybe they started with hair loss or ED, and then they kind of start to expand their suite of offerings with later rounds of funding, more patients, kind of more proof positive. Is the idea that as other um, psychedelic treatments gain more regulatory approval, Mind Bloom would be kind of positioned to um, already have that entree, already have that brand equity, and maybe the just kind of frankly muscle of helping people deal with that? Is that kind of the thesis? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's definitely a piece of the strategy, right? Like we're, as you pointed out, using ketamine as a wedge or beachhead to build the consumer brand, provider network, distribution channels, uh, therapeutic uh, programs and software, uh, such that as these other medications, such as MDMA assisted therapy in early 2023, psilocybin assisted therapy in 24, 25, 
and there's about a dozen other psychedelic medications in phase one and two clinical trials. There are phase three phases of clinical trials that take usually 12 years. Um, you know, we're best positioned to rapidly get those medications to all the people who need them as quickly as possible and help them get the most out of them. Uh, but I think there are a couple other uh, key differences that are maybe even more core to our strategy. Uh, one is, whereas HIMS looked at this medication that was um, sort of off patent and generic and able to be prescribed at a more affordable price, uh, they saw a medication where uh, because essentially dudes historically don't go to the doctor, uh, there, it was massively underserved. So a lot of people, uh, doctors believe, should be using these medications but aren't because they don't go to the doctor, it's inconvenient, it's embarrassing, uh, it's expensive to buy it on label or um, on uh, patent, so like on patent Propecia versus generic finasteride. Uh, and there's a stigma problem. Uh, so people see it as weird or scary or gross or, or icky, or they just don't know about it. Uh, and so they have created this consumer brand and telemedicine platform to dramatically increase access to treatment. Uh, Mind Bloom is similar in that we saw some similar issues with ketamine therapy. Uh, it's really new and scary for people. A lot of people don't know about ketamine therapy as an available treatment. Uh, it was extremely expensive before Mind Bloom. The average cost of treatment was like $600 to $1,200 a session. And we brought it down to less than $200 per session. Uh, and it was really hard to access. There aren't that many ketamine clinics. They're more growing. Uh, but still, to have somebody drive you a couple hours or an hour to a clinic, sit with you for two hours, drive you back 20 times over the next year uh, is a huge uh, burden and inconvenience. Uh, and also, it's not really a great experience sometimes to go into like a medical clinic. Uh, but there's another key difference, which is... Uh, Hims and Roman are taking these really established and you know large in terms of billions of dollars of sales medications uh, and creating a better way for people to access them and a better brand and a better experience. Uh, at Mind Balloon, we're taking this medication that pretty much nobody is using. Uh, so when you when you dig into the mental health care crisis, which is largely considered like the number one public health care crisis, uh, what you find is that the existing treatment options that tens of millions of Americans are using, like SSRIs, like Prozac and Lexapro, or even talk therapy, uh, just aren't that effective. Uh, a lot of psychiatrists go into uh, psychiatry or mental health care to help people, and then they're given like uh, a hammer and chisel. Like, like we're still in the age of mercury and bloodletting and, and leeches when it comes to mental health care. When you look at the clinical research around ketamine therapy, uh, what you see is it's just 10 times more effective. Uh, so SSRIs only work for like, uh, any SSRI only works like 40 to 47% of the time. It takes six to eight weeks to work. It has horrendous side effects for over 50% of people, like weight gain, sexual dysfunction, insomnia, suicidality, severe anxiety. Uh, and people get stuck on this daily medication they don't want to be on. A ketamine therapy is clinically shown to work for 65 to 70 percent of people it works right away it doesn't have these side effects uh, and it can be taken periodically uh, and in my mind we're giving people even better clinical outcomes because we've combined the coaches and mental health care providers who are helping people before during and after get the most out of these experiences to drive better results uh, so it's both the increasing access, uh, but it's also about getting people to switch from these legacy treatments to the new treatments of the future that, you know, that is what we're going to see mental health care look like over the next five to 10 years. Interesting. So can, before we take a, a step any further, uh, mm -hmm. people generally will have, you know, heard of psychedelics or probably at, at the, maybe the low end of the spectrum, they've never, you know, tried anything in any way, shape or form. And they've watched some movie where like someone did it. And then, you know, I don't know if it's Andres okay. Thompson or, or whatever, yeah. but, um, <laughs> you know, in the context of that, candidly, I, um, you know, either have tried or know more about, um, I would say LSD and psilocybin and MDMA, because those just seem at least to me, like more culturally, you're more likely to hear about that. Maybe just, I'm, I'm not as sophisticated in like a hip hop song or in reference to going to a festival. Um, can you talk about ketamine maybe in the context of those other ones? What, where's this being derived? Like what's the kind of history of it? Yeah. Uh, so like you pointed out, most people know about LSD or psilocybin magic mushrooms. Uh, those are what are called classical psychedelics. Uh, they act on your serotonin system, uh, which regulates like mood as well as a bunch of other things. Uh, and they really uh, sort of actuate that serotonin system and 
uh, sort of subjectively or phenomenologically, like what it feels like, uh, enhance all of your senses to the point of extreme distortion. And that's what like a classic trip feels like. That's your visual senses, your auditory senses, your olfactory senses, and your cognitive senses. Uh, MDMA is a little different in that it's this like empathogenic experience that also acts on your serotonin and dopamine systems. Uh, and so it feels for people like this deep sense of connection to others, this deep um, sense of uh, sort of warmth and euphoria, uh, which can be really powerful for a lot of mental health and well-being issues, but especially like PTSD because it allows people to open up so they can deal with and interact with their trauma in a healthy way and then overcome it. A ketamine, uh, combines a, a little bit about the two, but it actually acts on like a completely different receptor system. So it acts on your glutamate system, which is the most common neurotransmitter in your brain. And it sort of has this sense of cutting off your senses. Uh, and so for people, they can feel like this very out of body experience uh, where uh, it almost feels like it's way more in the background and they have a lot of memories that can come up uh, similar to MDMA, but not to the same degree, it can feel very empathogenic and people can feel this deep sense of connection with others and the universe. Um, but maybe most importantly, what it does is it creates this state of what's called neuroplasticity in the brain, which LSD and psilocybin also do, uh, whereby uh, people have this enhanced sort of creativity and this enhanced brain state where they're able to more able, more easily able to create like new connections in the brain. Uh, and so both during the experience and then for like one to two weeks after, uh, people are able to actually change their behavior, uh, whether that's creating new behaviors or breaking bad habits um, and take a lot of the insights that came up during the experience and put those into action. Interesting. So is basically the, the I, I don't want to say numbness because I don't think that's really what you were saying. You, you, ha you obviously have the more precise language of explaining these experiences for folks, but the kind of uh, cutting off of other senses um, that's related to why this is actually FDA approved because it's history is less on a mental health angle and more as an anesthetic for, mm. you know, helping people with other procedures. Is that why this has been approved for a while? And other ones are like, you know, 2023, maybe sometime down the line. Yeah, and so as ketamine was FDA approved as an anesthetic and analgesic uh, in 1970, so over 50 years ago now, uh, it's been widely used worldwide as one of the safest anesthetics since then. And it's used every single day in every single emergency room in the United States. Uh, even in World War II, it was a medication that every single soldier had on them because if somebody was undergoing some physical trauma, ketamine was the safest way to sort of knock them out so that they wouldn't go into shock and so that they could be you know, taken back and, and, and worked on. Uh, about 20 years ago, uh, some uh, really enterprising psychiatrists and researchers at uh, Yale discovered that at really low sub-anesthetic doses, it had these antidepressant effects. Uh, and people you know, have also used it recreationally at these low sub-anesthetic doses. So this is like you know, 1 20th to 1 5th of what a child would receive in the emergency room. Uh, at those low doses, uh, we could talk about the brain chemistry around if you're interested, but essentially at those low doses, it has a different effect and it has these psychedelics effects and it has this, uh, this neuroplastic effect for people uh, that is very much like a psychedelic experience where people can see sort of shapes and colors and visions and feel warm and pathogenic and have these insights from their own memories or things that come up cognitively that are these like aha epiphany moments uh, that can last for people for the rest of their lives. Gotcha. So when you're booting up a company like this, you know, we, this audience is familiar with, you know, the difference between the VC track and bootstrapping. Um, and there's some kind of obvious basics of, you know, we, we got to, you know, um, figure out how we're selling this thing. We got to figure out how the, you know, if it's software, how the code's being written, or if this is a physical good, how um, it's, you know, being produced and, and shipped to where it needs to go. Can you take us through some of the blocking and tackling of getting a company like this off the ground? Because, you know, there's a, there's a telehealth component where you're having, I believe you said guides or coaches who are, you know, actually interfacing with people. You have partners that you have to develop up that are, um, I, I would imagine the ones actually writing the scripts, um, and then some sort of like pharmaceutical supply chain to actually get this controlled substance into people's homes. Um, I'm guessing, you know, you said direct to consumer, so via the mail system. 
Um, so can you just maybe talk us through that? That, that sounds like a, a load of complexity that you know, you've know you actually had to shoulder the load of, we just now get to learn from. Yeah, uh, so that's, such, that's interesting. I don't feel like I started MindBloom two years ago. I feel like I started it 13 years ago when psychedelics first changed my life. And they've been okay. a big, huge part of my life for the last 13 years as I built two other, uh, call it like world positive companies um, in um, local politics and, and then financial technology. Um, when I came to starting MindBloom, uh, step one was I became a ketamine therapy patient myself. <laughs> it arrived on my doorstep, uh, had the aha moment when I did it and saw that it was just as transformational as a lot of other psychedelic medicines that I've done, uh, that here's this incredible medication that is prescribable and deliverable via telemedicine and via the mail uh, that most people don't know about and it's super expensive. And that what you do before, during, and after the experience dramatically affects the quality of the experience. So there's an opportunity to build not just like a commodity product where we just ship it cheap, but an experiential product where we build the world's greatest psychedelic therapy experiences at scale. Uh, so there I have the idea, but to your question, like now what, <laughs> it's just like, you know, just, just, uh, you know, me leaving my last company and I co-founded and, you know, having a laptop and, uh, and a co-working, uh, membership and what do I do? Um, unfortunately I was able to, you know, quickly raise money from, uh, previous investors in my companies, uh, friends and other people I knew who were really passionate about this. Um, that included, um, um founders fund as well. Um, uh, but once I had the capital, which, you know, as, as a third time founder is sort of the easy part, um, the hard part was uh, building the legal and clinical team and framework to ensure that like we could do this and we could do this safely. Like, this is serious stuff. Uh, so step one was going out and um, having, after I did my own research, a lot of conversations with health, some of the top healthcare lawyers uh, and building a legal and regulatory framework around how we could do this. Uh, that took about three to six months. Uh, in tandem, uh, recruiting a medical director. Uh, so this was literally the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire entrepreneurial career is going out and finding a partner who is a leading psychiatrist and psychedelic research, Dr. Dr. Casey Palios, who's a principal investigator on the uh, MDMA clinical trials and is probably one of the I don't know, top 10 or 20 uh, researchers in all of psychedelic medicine. Uh, he's an absolute pioneer who did like the landmark psilocybin for cancer anxiety study, a uh, big part of the uh, ketamine for depression study at NYU, which was landmark and uh, as a pioneer doing ketamine therapy in his own private practice. Um, once I met him and so we got together and saw that we had an aligned vision, uh, it was bringing on a head of clinical operations to work uh, with uh, our medical director and with a clinical advisory board of other top psychiatrists and researchers that we built uh, to build the clinical practice guidelines and safety protocols, uh, stand up a pilot facility in New York to sort of test a hybrid in-person remote treatment model. Uh, and all that took over a year in order just to get our first patient in the door uh, in a way that where we could start seeing, okay, we know that this is safe. Uh, you know, there are no MVPs when it comes to providing uh, medical care, much less psychedelic medical care. Like everything clinically has to be completely, you know, buttoned up end to end. Um, um, and that was sort of the, the genesis of it. Um, other things I did, I think are, are pretty unique. Um, my, uh, my wife, my partner in crime, Allie, uh, she part-time built our early uh, uh, software platform. Uh, she was director of engineering at a billion dollar company where she was a founding engineer at. Um, and she ended up coming aboard full time as our head of engineering and manages about 25 engineers now. Um, my head of clinical operations, I mentioned, was actually one of my best friends. Um, he was the best man at my wedding, a top healthcare consultant. He uh, was helping me recruit through his network and realized that you know, he's just as passionate about psychedelic medicine, mental health care as I am, uh, and came aboard to, to build this with me. Um, so those are some of the uh, sort of early pieces that we got in place in order to you know begin building this platform that you know would bring on what's now I think over a hundred psychiatrists and psychiatric clinicians and psychedelic coaches and guides um, to you know treat thousands and thousands of people through our platform. Epic. Um, there, there's so much to unpack there. I think you know my my just immediate takeaway is it you know that the, they say very often, rightfully so, that success compounds. So having the previous exits, like we didn't really spend much time on raising money, like you said, because if you've delivered a, a, a W or two to past investors, 
not a guarantee, but the likelihood that they'll, you know, roll the dice again with you is relatively high. And then just, you know, cycling through the list of characters that you brought in, um, you know, the networks that you build from building companies in the past, obviously, and having a dynamite wife is another thing. A dynamite partner is another thing <laughs> that uh, helps with that. Um, I, I, I can speak to that from experience, but um, the, the thing that I want to hang on is the fact that you said uh, that uh, recruiting uh, Dr. Paleos was the hardest thing that you've ever done in your entrepreneurial experiences. So this is three startups. This is not like some throwaway phrase here. Um, can you, can you, sorry, go ahead. Can, can you just take us, take us deeper into that? Because that's something that most of us have never done. And uh, we'd love to learn just you know, what goes into it, how you even identify that person, let alone convince them to join you. Yeah. So yeah, can you imagine going out and having conversations with dozens of, you know, psychiatrists in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s <laughs> as like a tech entrepreneur and telling them like you want to build a platform to dramatically increase the amount of people who are able to access ketamine therapy, ideally eventually through the mail completely in order to dramatically reduce costs. Uh, there are some very funky conversations. <laughs> um, I'm sure yeah, you got so some I epic nose too. Um, you know, this is actually interesting is early on, I thought that what we were doing or what I wanted to do, or what I wanted to partner with someone to figure out how to do together was going to sound a lot stranger than it is. Uh, when you get into psychiatry, you get into it to help people. And then the psychiatrist, as I said earlier, like given like a hammer and chisel and told to go do surgery, like brain surgery, and they're frustrated as hell. And so they're looking at the clinical research around psychedelics and they're salivating, uh, even if they don't talk about it as publicly, like here is this promise and this hope of uh, medication or suite of treatments and a whole new paradigm for how to treat people with mental health and well-being issues that could be literally 10 or hundred times more effective. Uh, that's a dream come true. Uh, so people are, I think, are actually a lot more receptive than I anticipated. Uh, the challenge was so many people I talked to, if they, they were using ketamine therapy, maybe it only treated like 13 clients with it. <laughs> so it was just still so early and so, so new. Uh, what I did was I uh, built a scraper, <laughs> scraped uh, a ton of different psychiatrists and psychologists, uh, directories and websites and dumped all that into a database, uh, used an outbound sales software to sort of like mass blast a ton of people to try to set up conversations. Um, the, I had a bunch of conversations with people and the, um, the person I partnered with, Dr. Casey Palios, who's a pioneer in the space that I mentioned, uh, I actually never didn't reach out to him. I reached out to somebody else who just replied, no. <laughs> and I responded, do you know anybody who might be interested? Uh, she gave me two names. Uh, and the other one person responded like, hell no. And then uh, uh, Casey, our eventual medical director, and he's now our science director leading our clinical research efforts. Uh, uh, responded yes. And we started chatting and I was chatting with a bunch of people at the time and realized that we had a, a really uh, sort of united vision about how it was still sort of day one of figuring out how to help people get the most out of treatment and that there were going to be businesses and people like me coming into the space. And uh, the best thing to do would be for people like him who had built their life's work around this to partner with businesses to figure out how to as safely and responsibly get these medications and treatments out into the world to the people who could benefit them to reduce human suffering. Um, and we had sort of a long courtship of uh, seeing if there was a lot of you know fit here in terms of philosophy and approach uh, before we decided to, to partner up and and to put this put his work in the world out into the world you know on, on a bigger scale. Right on. So. Um, at this stage of the game, can you just talk in general about like how, how long into this thing did, you know, the first revenue even come through the door? Like what is, what is, and, and, and kind of further down the line, you talked about taking this ketamine treatment. I, I'm, I'm trying to retain these numbers correctly down from like 600 to $200 for someone to do this. It sounds like that's not necessarily covered by insurance in most cases. So can you just kind of give us some of the blocking, tackling X's and O's of the actual um, dollars being exchanged? Hmm. Yeah, sir. I started uh, working on the company in earnest in probably like late 2018, mostly just like personal research. Um, uh, took in our first cash in like late 2018, early 2019. Um, uh, we uh, built, spent that year building out the clinical protocols and started seeing the first clients in I want to say September of 2019. Um, 
we did sort of like a private launch. So I don't think we launched our website until like January of 2020 even, and we didn't do any marketing or any sort of um, you know, PR or press or outreach until I think March of 2020, after we had seen about a few hundred clients through the, the platform and had seen that they all had these incredible clinical outcomes and 100% safety record. Uh, right about that time, COVID happened. And given that we had done, you know, over a thousand sessions, uh, had already become one of the, you know, emerging larger like providers of ketamine therapy, just privately, even without like advertising or anything, uh, decided that we would accelerate and have the opportunity to accelerate our fully virtual timeline a year or two. Um, and so at that point, it, you know, really started growing quickly. Uh, we raised, uh, you know, meaningful round of series A funding in like July. I'll say August of 2019, um, and have since then just been growing and, have, you know, since become by far the largest provider of psychedelic therapy in the world, uh, you know, have raised over 50 million in funding from, you know, top VCs, uh, and have grown the team to over 150, uh, and are now massively scaling out our platform to bring ketamine and other psychedelic therapies to every single person and starting the U S who needs them, uh, for, you know, every single indication that psychedelics could help people for. And in terms of revenue, is this being paid out of pocket? Is there like a commission when a, a ketamine prescriptions filled? Like what's, what's happening there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a six session treatment program. Uh, it costs uh, a little less than $200 a session, for that six session treatment. And then Got subsequent it. programs are a little less than that, like $120 a session. Um, um, it's all cash pay, although some of our clients do get reimbursed out of network, uh, through their insurance companies, uh, mental health care is like notoriously hard to get reimbursed for, for psychiatrists and, and doctors, uh, yeah. it's something that we're trying to change. And we have a sort of long-term roadmap and we're already in conversations with payers to try to bundle our platform and program or our treatment plans into something that could be reimbursed and a meaningful rate for clients. Uh, uh, and I anticipate we're going to continue to bring the cost down as we continue to get scale and to get more efficient. Uh, but like when you look at the cost, it's cheaper than talk therapy already. Um, like a year of in-network talk therapy is like five thousand dollars, right? If you're even if you're doing it with insurance being covered, uh, and if you're talking about therapists out of network, like that's like one hundred fifty to four hundred dollars a session just for a forty-five to an hour minute long, uh, you know, chat with a talk therapist. Um, so I think we've already dramatically reduced the cost and made it affordable to most Americans. Uh, but the name of the game is obviously to continue increasing access to this by making it more approachable for people and destigmatizing it and uh, getting people to see that this is a really legitimate, clinically effective, proven treatment, not just some you know alternative treatment. Uh, bringing the cost down and you know making it accessible by continuing to open up as many states as we can. We'll be in like 42 states next year uh, to reach as many Americans as possible. So I, you said 15 states earlier, you're saying 42 by next year. Is that just legislation getting through? Is that licensing? What's, what's happening there to even, you know, because to me, that seems like the obvious kind of two levers of uncapping growth for you guys is if in some way, shape or form, this was more covered by uh, insurers, and then it was just able to be accessed in more markets. Yeah. So that's one lever. It is just licensing of clinicians. It takes a while to build out medical practices essentially in every single state. So it's something that we've been working on for, you know, call it 18 months now, expanding nationwide. Uh, and so we'll be in like third, like I think 25 or 30 states by the end of this year and then 42 early next. Uh, and another, another lever too, is just building out treatment protocols and programs for different indications for people. So we're, helping people with anxiety and depression now, uh, but there's some great clinical research around ketamine and other psychedelic therapies efficacy for things like um, OCD, PTSD, eating disorder, social anxiety disorder, couples therapy, uh, potentially even like, a, you know, substance use disorder, alcohol use disorder, uh, you know, nicotine addiction, uh, weight loss. Um, so we're going to be continuing to expand the platform too, so that we can help you know, as many people with the specific things that are affecting their mental health and well-being using psychedelic therapy and ketamine therapy, which would be another way to increase access. Right on. So the mission is relatively legible, right? We've got a mental health crisis. Um, 
you know, I'm, I'm, I'm regurgitating your lines again, but you know, it's, it's one of the most kind of pervasive widespread, um, you know, health challenges that, that people are facing out there. Um, and I just, you know, I guess as we aim towards wrapping up, can you just put a little bit more color on the salience of this mission? Um, and, and kind of why this is because, you know, I, I, I say, we say that in one regard and, you know, mm-hmm. I've lost someone to uh, suicide and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, there, there's, there's other instances where people can like point to something directly at home that they've had to face. Uh, but there's also a degree to which it's not as in your face as other epidemics that are visually apparent to people. Um, so can you maybe just, you know, paint a little bit more color on the intensity of, of this kind of problem that is being yeah. faced from your, from your point of view? Well, I think you just hit on it. I have not met a single person as a mental health care CEO now who does not have a one degree separation from a extremely acute and serious mental health care issue, either themselves or a close friend or family member. Uh, suicide is the second leading cause of death for people under 35. And it's the fourth leading cause of death for people uh, 35 to 55. Uh, Depression is the number one cause of disability worldwide. Uh, And like you, I have seen that firsthand. Like my family is riddled with mental health care issues. Uh, A lot of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder in my family. Uh, My mother uh, was schizophrenic, uh, an addict. I grew up in a really turbulent home. She ended up homeless for 15 years before dying of a drug overdose. and through those experiences, what I saw is and through my own psychedelic experiences that have helped me never have to have a mental health care issue um, and have made me a better person for myself and others. Uh, I've seen that mental health care issues don't just affect the individual, which is super tragic, uh, but it affects their friends, their family, their community, and it affects the human capital that they have to go on and do work in the world and contribute. Uh, my mother was not able to contribute anything despite being a really intelligent woman, right? She couldn't even take care of herself and we couldn't even take care of her as a society. Uh, and that is like an utter waste. Uh, so our big mission in Mind Bloom is to transform lives, to transform the world, to help people become better people for themselves, but better people for the world. Uh, and when you look at anecdotes of people who talk about their psychedelic experiences and call it you know, abs- absolutely life-changing like it has been for me, uh, or if you look at the clinical research, around how much more efficacious, you know, these medications and and treatments are than everything else out there. Uh, It just becomes very obvious and clear that one of the biggest things that we can do to create a better world, uh, to create better people and to reduce suffering overall is to get these medications into the hands of people who need them as quickly as possible in a really safe, responsible way and continue to learn and figure out how to help people get the most out of them. Because it's still day one. Like we've discovered how to split the atom, and, but we <laughs> haven't yet figured out how to create a nuclear power reactor when it comes to psychedelics. Uh, and that's, you know, I think a lot of the, the challenge and a lot of the uh, excitement around the space is how we're going to actually apply these to help people. Yeah. I, I, what I always just think about is, you know, most of the healthiest people I know became, and I'm, I'm talking mostly physically, just it, for the, the sake of this example, took like 110% responsibility, experimenting with themselves, doing their own research and finding the kind of formula for Mm -hmm. their own health. So I have a very good friend um, who I I feel like I reference now almost like every other episode, but you know, he has got like the most flawless skin, physique, everything the whole way down and, and kind of, you know, by all accounts seems very uh, mentally grounded as well. But, you know, he is someone that, you know, has the degree in nutrition, reads the academic literature and all the journals and, and, you know, digs and digs and digs for his own kind of solution in this regard. And I, I know that part of the platform you hear is, you know, interfacing with those professionals that can either, you know, legally prescribe something or not. But, you know, if we, we evaluate your story and your own kind of experimentation with this stuff 12 or 13 years ago, there is a degree to which I have to imagine you were seeing some of these, you know, mental health pop, uh, you know, issues flare up in your family and trying to find your kind of path or gateway to avoiding that fate and finding a better outcome for yourself. Um, and, and that's really, the, you know, the kind of story here, at, at least from my side, everyone needs help. Everyone needs a community, but your ability to, you know, go hunt for what it is that you need is really the thing that kind of unlocks everything. Mm, I couldn't agree more. Like it starts with taking hundred percent responsibility. And it's actually this awesome movement we're seeing in healthcare overall, which is a move away from old medicine. That's really reactive, patriarchal, like wait till you're sick and then we'll treat it. Go listen to a doctor and just do whatever they say. 
um, which can be good, but iatrogenics or, uh, you know, sort of medical error is the number three cause of death in the U S. So it's really hard for a doctor to get a snapshot of your health and then, you know, tell you what to do without you being an active participant. And now we're shifting to new medicine, which is more proactive. Uh, it's about people taking responsibility of their own health, uh, doing their own research, trying their own things, uh, and creating a, you know, more of a focus on holistic health versus waiting until you get, you know, really sick. Um, and I think the same is starting to happen with mental health care where people are looking at talk therapy, like, oh, you don't just go to talk therapy when you're, you know, disturbed, you go to become a healthier version of yourself. Uh, and psychedelics are going to be a massive part of that wave to new medicine and mental health care uh, because they can help people achieve these, you know, significantly better states of mental health and well-being, you know, before they need to get on antidepressants necessarily. Beautiful. Well, I dig the mission, man. I'm excited to see you guys continue to uh, trailblaze and, and, you know, set more uh, flags in the ground um, and, and avenues by which to help people. Um, I want to aim towards wrapping up, ask our standard last questions. Before I do that, is there anything else you were hoping to share today that I just did, did not give you the chance to? Um, the only thing I would share is um, MindBloom is growing really quickly. Uh, we are uh, a really mission obsessed organization that's building a really unique culture of consciousness. I actually started the company as a remote first asynchronous company a year before COVID. Uh, and we, uh, I think, do a lot of things that are uh, very magnetic in terms of culture. They uh, attract some, but repel most. Uh, but we're hiring uh, you know, across product engineering, design, marketing, we're hiring psychiatric clinicians, psychedelic guides. Uh, and so if anybody listening has a really deep, sincere passion for psychedelic therapy and the future mental health and well-being, uh, we would absolutely love to hear from you. Right on. Uh, if they want to do that or just kind of follow along with MindBloom generally, what digital coordinates can we provide for people? Yeah, uh, you can find MindBloom at mindbloom.com. Uh, we also have uh, a Twitter account and a, an Instagram account, my mind bloom, uh, and we have a, a careers page. But even if you see uh, a role, if, if you have a role that you don't see on the careers page, uh, we have a, you know, a, a section for that. We'd still like to hear from you. Dope. Um, how hard was mind bloom of a domain name to snag? Oh, well, you see the namesake for mind bloom behind me, a couple pieces. Yeah. Here, Android Jones, psychedelic art. Um, um, what well, we're looking to communicate with mind bloom was, uh, wisdom, uh, clarity and growth. <laughs> I did a whole mind map exercise. Um, I got mindbloom.com, uh, for the low, low price of $37,000, uh, with the, uh, the domain brokers that I previously, uh, used to secure mighty.com at my last company. Um, so I'm it, sure that one was a little bit more. There's a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> Mighty.com is good, but it's only valuable to me. Mighty.com is a premium domain. name. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, beautiful. We're going to link all of that in the show notes for people to check it out. And um, they can find that at goingdeepwithaaron.com slash podcast or in the app where you're probably listening to this right now. But Dylan, before I let you go, I'd like to give you the mic one final time to issue an actionable personal challenge to the audience. Hmm. Uh, I'm going to uh, allude to what you said earlier about people who take 110% responsibility over their health and you seeing that as like, the most important uh, behavior for people's health. I actually talk about that all the time, that deciding to take control over your health, including your own mental health and well-being, is like the first and most important uh, behavior or decision that you can make. Uh, there's so many things you can do and try. Um, obviously, psychedelic medicine has been a massive part of my life and you know, mindbloom.com is a vehicle for that. Um, but I think one of the other things that's been most meaningful to me, or if you told me 10 years ago, this would be one, the most, one of the most important parts of your mental health and well-being practice, I would tell you you're nuts, uh, is reading uh, books and literature about mental health and well-being. Um, and some of that could be like enlightenment literature or sort of like Eastern uh, philosophy or um, you know, things like that, or stoicism, um, or even like, like positive psychology. Um, so I would, I would challenge your audience to, uh, to pick up a book on mental health and well-being. Uh, it could be a book like Awareness by Anthony DeMello or The Surrender Experiment uh, by Michael Singer or Letters from a Stoic by Seneca. Uh, Tim Ferriss produced an incredible audio book on it uh, that I highly recommend. Um, or you can look into books on positive psychology specifically and then the science of happiness. 
uh, and start reading about mental health and well-being. Uh, that might have been the first and most important behavior reading about mental health and well-being that got me started on my path to realizing this was something I wanted to focus on and wasn't just going to happen on its own. Right on. And that's the same type of thing where you kind of touched on a couple of different like schools of thought or approaches to something like that. And it's, you know, it, it's the responsibility in conjunction with experimentation. Like maybe stoicism just ain't your bag. You, you read it, you chew on it. Like this just isn't for me. I'm going to find a different approach that kind of mixes with my, um, you know, brain and DNA and all that stuff the right way. So I think that's a really good kind of pairing of the two. Dylan, thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. I really enjoyed talking with you. Thanks, Darren. This was a blast. Appreciate you having me on. We just went deep with Dylan Bynan. Hope you're out there. Has a fantastic day. Hey, thanks for watching to the end of my interview with Dylan. If you enjoyed learning about the building blocks of one of these fast growing businesses, then you would also like our recent interview with Joe Prococo. He talks all about the building blocks of a fintech startup.